Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. So, okay, so far what we've seen is that uh, if you get DNA damage, what's going to happen is that these uh, ataxia telangiectasia mutated proteins and this ataxia telangiectasia and rad free related protein, they are going to become active. And when they're active, they are serine threonine kinases, which means that they add phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues in proteins. Now, uh, one of their targets, well, in fact, two of their targets, are these checkpoint kinase enzymes, so checkpoint kinase 1 and checkpoint kinase 2. And when they add a phosphate group onto the checkpoint kinase 1 slash checkpoint kinase 2 enzyme, it causes that enzyme to become activated. And this enzyme is now an active serine threonine kinase itself. So again, it is now going to add phosphate groups onto, um, onto serine and threonine residues in proteins. Okay, and the way it's going to work is it's going to phosphorylate, basically, serine and threonine residues on the P53 protein. Okay, so let's show this happening. So, before I uh, tell you about the phosphorylation of P53, I need to tell you a little bit about how P53 in a normal cell is kept turned off. Okay, so usually in a normal cell, we are producing P53 continuously. So this is tumor suppressor protein P53, the guardian of the genome. So, we're always making a little bit of P53. But how do we stop it from working? Because P53 has quite dramatic actions. It turns on DNA repair, it holds cell division, and it causes apoptosis if, if things get bad enough. So we don't want it always activated. So uh, the way in which we inactivate it is we also create a protein known as MDM2. Okay, And what MDM2 does is it binds to P53, like I've just shown, and basically, not only does it do that, um, but it also targets the P53 for ubiquitination. So, when the P53 is made, MDM2 binds to it, and that completely inactivates it initially. So, uh, once you've got this MDM2 bound to your P53, the P53 is no longer functional. But, if, as if that wasn't bad enough, uh, for the poor P53, it's also going to now be ubiquitinated. So MDM2 is going to target it, basically, to have a ubiquitin group stuck on the side of it. So I'll denote the ubiquitin group in green here. So this is a ubiquitin group. And basically, proteins which get, which get ubiquitin stuck on the side of them, like this P53, end up getting destroyed by the proteasome. So this whole complex is now going to go to the proteasome, which I'll denote as this sort of tube here, okay, and basically it's going to be destroyed. So that is how, by making this protein MDM2, you control P53, so you keep it on a leash, basically, you stop it from uh, working, uh, usually, because you're always making a little bit of it, so what MDM2 does is it initially binds to it, stops it from functioning, then it targets it for ubiquitination, and then it, that P53 is then destroyed. So it's basically made to be destroyed, so it might seem a bit wasteful, but that's what happens. Okay, right, so... Um, we want to activate the P53, so the way that checkpoint kinase 1 slash checkpoint kinase 2 activates the P53 is it stops it from being able to interact with MDM2. So basically, if this is a piece of P53 which has just been synthesized, um, okay, what the checkpoint kinase 1 or checkpoint kinase 2 enzyme is going to do is it's going to stick a phosphate group onto the P53 protein. Now, once you have a phosphate group stuck on that P53, MDM2 can no longer bind. So MDM2 can't bind to it anymore, which means that the P53 isn't going to be inhibited by MDM2 binding. In addition, if MDM2 is not there, it doesn't get targeted for ubiquitination, and then it doesn't get destroyed by the proteasome. So phosphorylating this P53 means that it actually survives. It's created, and it actually survives. It isn't instantly... Um, instantly um, descended upon by this MDM2 protein and then destroyed. Uh, instead, it gets to survive. 
Right, so this is the way in which the checkpoint kinase 1 slash checkpoint kinase 2 activates P53. So now what we need to see is what's P53 going to do. And for that, we'll get another piece of paper. All right. Okay, so P53's function then. Right, so P53 forms dimers, of, uh, sorry, tetramers rather, of active P53. So it acts as a transcription factor, but it doesn't do it alone. Instead, what it does is it gets together with three other buddies and forms a tetramer. So here's the tetramer of P53. So all of these are P53s which have been activated, basically, and have managed to escape uh, MDM2. Okay, and this tetramer is now going to act as a transcription factor for uh, a bunch of hot target genes, basically. So let's say our DNA is here. Okay, and in eukaryotic cells, upstream of every gene in the genome, what you have is a region known as the promoter region. And uh, the promoter region is not involved in uh, coding for any protein. Instead, what it's involved in is controlling how much of the downstream gene is actually made, okay? Well, how much of the gene product of the downstream gene is actually made. So let's say in green here, I'm denoting the gene, okay? So this is the gene, and uh, P53 doesn't bind to the gene. Instead, it binds to this promoter box uh, or promoter region, which is upstream of the gene. Now, the way in which the promoter region controls how much of the gene product of this gene you make is that uh, it controls um, how, um, how likely the uh, RNA polymerase enzyme is to come and bind to it and then to begin the transcription of the gene. So in order to get the gene expressed, in order to actually uh, make the gene product that the gene codes for, you need RNA polymerase to come along and produce an mRNA strand which is complementary to the coding strand of the gene. In order for that to happen, RNA polymerase has to bind slightly upstream of the gene, basically, and it binds to this promoter region. So if the promoter region has a higher affinity for binding RNA polymerase, then RNA polymerase will bind more often and you'll get more mRNA being produced for this gene. And therefore, if you get more mRNA being produced, you'll get more protein being produced. So uh, by, uh, by controlling the affinity of this promoter region for the um, RNA polymerase, you can control the amount of the gene that you actually express. Okay, so basically this tetramer of P53 is going to come and bind to certain promoter regions. And what it's going to do is it's going to increase the affinity of that promoter region for RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase will come and bind more often, and therefore you'll get more transcription of the gene. If you get more transcription of the gene, you'll get more mRNA. And if you get more mRNA, it follows you'll get more translation of the protein. Okay, so it's going to increase the expression of certain genes. Now, uh, basically, um, there are many genes that are increased in expression uh, by P53, they have their expression increased by P53. Uh, examples are you're going to increase the expression of proteins involved in DNA repair. So there are many different DNA repair mechanisms which we haven't yet talked about. Uh, we will do at some point because they're actually very important in um, the development of quite a few forms of cancer, for instance, breast cancer, uh, hereditary breast cancer um, is, well, uh, DNA repair mechanisms and hereditary mutations in the DNA repair mechanisms are incredibly important in hereditary breast cancer. Okay, um, so, uh, but we, we haven't discussed those yet, so I'll just sort of box them over here. So, um, P53 is going to lead to the increased expression of proteins that you need in order to repair the DNA. That makes sense. We have suffered this damage to the DNA. We've gone through this entire pathway. What was the point of it? What do we want to actually achieve out of it? Well, we want to repair the damage that was done. So, uh, we better actually activate these repair mechanisms, and that's what P53 is going to do. Now, it's also going to create the protein P21, 
which is an incredibly powerful tumor suppressor protein. And basically, the power of this protein is to completely halt the cell cycle. It halts it pretty much at whatever phase you are in. It stops the cell dividing, so it arrests the cell cycle. And if you want to see how it arrests the cell cycle, I advise you to uh, watch my videos on um, P53 and the response to DNA damage. So it arrests the cell cycle in which we discuss specifically how it arrests the cell cycle. In this video, we're more focusing on how it induces apoptosis rather than how it induces arrests the cell cycle. Okay, so uh, P21 is going to stop the cell dividing, and that makes sense as well. If you've got this cell that has suffered a mutation or some sort of DNA damage, you do not want this cell undergoing replication because there's a risk that things are going to go horribly wrong. I mean, we've got a double strand break in the DNA. What on earth is going to happen when you start pulling the um, sister chromatids apart? It's every, you know, it could be, could end up a complete mess. You could end up with huge chromosomal abnormalities in the two daughter cells. So to protect against that, you stop the cell dividing. Okay, and then if um, P53 levels are high, very, very high, and they remain high for a long period, then what would that indicate? That would indicate that if they remain high for a long period, it would indicate that the DNA repair mechanisms are not working, that this is not working. You're not managing to repair the DNA damage. It's still there. So um, basically what happens is the cell says, okay, we're, we're not going to be able to deal with this, so we need to commit suicide. So basically it's going to uh, make pro-apoptotic proteins. And now we are in a position to actually talk about which pro-apoptotic proteins are made. Okay, but we'll do that in the next video.